Now on Point 6 News at 4, what we're learning after a plane goes down in Vancouver, killing the pilot. And a brutal attack in the middle of the night at a Marion County home. Nearly a year later, family in search of the killer. Plus, as the nation discusses abortion rights, more people in our area offer to open their doors to women from out of state. We are digging deeper into how to help safely. Live, you're watching Coin 6 News at 4. Watching out for you. Nothing justifies this horrific crime. First at four, a tearful plea to the community in Salem, the family of a homicide victim putting the case back before the public and asking for justice. This is Coin 6 News at 4 o'clock. I'm Jenny Hansen. And I'm Dan Tilkin, the family of Travis Jutton calling for help, finding his killer, and announcing a reward for information leading to an arrest. Liz Birch was at that press conference today. She joins us in the studio. Liz, they are certainly desperate for answers. Oh, yeah, it was a really emotional press conference. So that reward will be $50,000. They say that came from community donation. As I asked the Marion County Sheriff's Office today, and they say they have not made any arrests yet in this murder, they're still looking for information. Investigators say in August of last year, an intruder came into Travis Jutton's rural Marion County home in the middle of the night, stabbing and killing Travis and wounding his wife, Jamie Lynn. Today, Travis's mother begged anyone who knows who did this to come forward. I never understood what a broken heart felt like until that morning of August 13th, 2021. A monster or monster decided that their life was more important than our son. Every day the grief gets worse as we have no answers. Somebody knows something. So I'm begging you as Travis's mother, whose heart breaks every day, to reach out to Detective Van Horn with any information you may have, no matter what it might be. Please be that hero I know that's out there. Hmm. His mom called him kind, sweet, and smart. She said he brought joy to them and happiness and says every day her grief gets worse. If you have any information, reach out to the Marin County Sheriff's Office detectives. Of course, we have information on how to do that on coin.com. Also on how to collect that reward if you do have information. Yeah, our heart just goes out to that family. Hopefully they can get some answers and get some closure. Thanks, Liz. New at four, the mayor of Portland announced a new strategy to make the city safer with all the gun violence we've been having. Mayor Ted Wheeler has appointed a new team to lead the Safer Summer PDX. It's made up of global and local violence prevention experts. It will work to stop and address gun violence over the next few months. We're following developing news out of Vancouver. A day long search for answers at Pearson Field. NTSB investigators are there trying to figure out what sent a single engine plane crashing to the ground, killing the pilot. Our Brandon Thompson is live at the airfield. Brandon, you spoke to a person who saw it unfold. And it was a thick tower of black smoke across the area originating from this airfield here. And you could actually still see that plane on the runway here at Pearson Field. Those two fire trucks and a water tender really just came on scene in the last several minutes as it looks like they're starting to dismantle the airplane. Several agencies have been on scene all day looking into this crash. It happened just after 730 this morning here at Pearson Field. That's just north of the Columbia River and east of I-5. The plane is about a quarter down the runway from where we're standing here. It's a single engine plane that crashed, a Beechcraft V-35B. According to the website flightaware.com, the plane took off heading west, then turned back around and landed, also head, heading in the westerly direction, and it was a 13-minute flight total. Vancouver Police says the pilot was the only person on board and the only person killed in this crash. Investigators from the Federal Aviation Administration and Na National Transportation Safety Board are looking into this. The NTSB is leading the investigation, and they say it could take months to figure out what happened. When Tyree, Chris Tyree, a white witness, got here, he says the flames were powerful. Airport personnel brought out fire extinguishers and it couldn't control it and it just took off again after that. So, but pretty big plume of black smoke. The Pearson Airfield or Pearson Field Airport website does note it has a quote unquote unique departure and approach procedures that pilots do need to be aware of. That is because the 
distance to Portland International Airport and it is very close by. There is also a flight school here at Pearson Field. I reached out to that flight school earlier today to see if this was their aircraft that was involved in the crash. They said they cannot comment on this case. Reporting live in Vancouver, Brandon Thompson, Coin 6 News. Brandon, thank you. Developing today, new revelations coming to light during the surprise hearing today from the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Natalie Brand has the testimony of the former White House staffer who spilled major secrets. In a last minute surprise hearing before the January 6th committee, the aide to former President Trump's White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said Mr. Meadows hinted about potential problems before the January 6th rally. There's a lot going on, Cass, but I don't know. Things might get real, real bad on January 6th. Cassidy Hutchinson said Mr. Trump's former personal attorney Rudy Giuliani boasted about plans in the days before the 6th. Something to the effect of, we're going to the Capitol, it's going to be great, the president's going to be there, he's going to look powerful. And she said she heard Giuliani mentioning right-wing groups before the rally. I recall hearing the word Oath Keeper and hearing the word Proud Boys closer to the planning of the January 6th rally when Mr. Giuliani would be around. Hutchinson also said former President Trump was furious that Secret Service metal detectors kept some of his supporters outside of the official rally on January 6th. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Hutchinson also testified the former president's White House counsel expressed serious legal concerns about Mr. Trump potentially going to the Capitol that day. And do you remember which crimes Mr. Cipollone was concerned with? In the days leading up to the 6th, we had conversations about potentially obstructing justice or defrauding the electoral count. Hutchinson also says she was told the former president tried to grab the steering wheel of his vehicle and lunged at his Secret Service agent when told they were going back to the White House. At the end of the hearing, Hutchinson said both Giuliani and Meadows sought presidential pardons. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. A former President Trump responded on his presidential platform that he hardly knows Cassidy Hutchinson and called her bad news. You can see more testimony and analysis on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell at 6.30 right here on Point 6. Today, the Biden administration laid out plans to protect women's access to abortion services after last week's U.S. Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Health and Human Services Secretary unveiled the Biden administration's action plan. It includes increasing access to abortion medication, ensuring privacy for patients and providers, and directing Medicare and Medicaid to protect family planning services, including emergency and long-acting contraceptives. We can't tell you there's a silver bullet. It takes a little time because we want to do it right and we want to do it according to the law. Secretary Becerra says all options are on the table, but he declined to give specifics on how the Biden administration will implement its plan. Here in the Northwest, a wave of abortion rights supporters are offering their help to those who may not have access to abortion in their states. Our Lisa Balick is digging deeper into this issue. She joins us live from downtown Portland with what she found out. Yeah, organizations are seeing hundreds of women offering to help house and help women coming in here from other states, states where they expect that there will be bans or really restrictive issues on abortion. Now, what we found on social media is a lot of postings, especially here in Oregon. People are posting for women have a place to stay, help with transportation, sometimes using words like help with camping. But nonprofit organizations like Northwest Abortion Access Fund say those who want to help should reach out to their organization or others to offer their services. We have the infrastructure and we have the safety and security to be able to do so. And that's really where my fear in creating something different and creating something new comes from, is there's a real danger that puts both clients and people participating in those networks at risk. And what she means by that is it's not just for physical safety, but possible legal issues as well. The Northwest Abortion Access Fund serves Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Idaho, helping women get to clinics and have a place to stay. They tell me so far they have received more than 800 offers of help, 
They say that is just overwhelming to them. They say the best thing you can do is please don't call them because it's blocking access for people trying to get services. They say please go to their website, email them if you have a place or want to offer other volunteer services. I'll have more on this today at 5. Live in downtown Portland, Lisa Balick, Coin 6 News. Also coming up, we'll hear more on abortion access from the candidates running for the governor of Oregon. Stay with Coin 6 for continuing coverage. Meteorologist Joseph Dames and for Natasha today, the weather cooled down significantly. But you know, I went on a walk. It was actually pretty nice. I mean, it was like I got a little hot. You were moving and it. grooving, it sounds like. I was like. moving and Getting grooving. Your steps in. As Getting I the steps in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we had the cloud coverage earlier this morning. We're finally breaking through that. But temperatures are cool, about 25 degrees cooler than where we were sitting at this time yesterday. And if it was a year ago, it's about 40 degrees different. Take a look. We have some blue sky out there finally. We had some clouds passing by, 73 degrees right now in Portland, which is the warmest temperature that we have encountered so far today. West Southwest breeze about 10 miles per hour. We'll keep some sunshine and some broken clouds in the forecast the next couple of hours. In fact, we may clear it all the way out before they're going to return overnight. 72 degrees coming out of Salem. We have some mid 80s out towards Pendleton and Baker City. Burns coming in at 90. Cooler there for the Oregon coast, as I mentioned. Right here in the Willamette Valley, almost 25 degrees cooler than where we're sitting at this time yesterday, where it hit 96. All right, we'll talk about some summer heat, but also we'll have a look at the 4th of July weekend coming up in just a few minutes. Also coming up, we're tracking the start of local forest fires as summer heats up. And TriMet passengers get quite the scare as two men on board are spotted armed with a gun. We have learned a former principal of a local elementary school will spend over 40 years in prison after he was convicted of sexually abusing students. Jeffrey Hayes was arrested in March of last year on seven sex abuse charges connected to incidents involving four different students. He was principal of Deep Creek Elementary from 2005 to 2009, then became executive director at the City View Charter School in Hillsborough. He was convicted by a jury in Clackamas County and sentenced today to 43 years, nine months.
And two people were arrested after a gun scare on the Max train in Portland's Goose Hollow neighborhood. A police posted this to Instagram today, saying they were called after witnesses saw the two men holding a gun. The police determined it to be a realistic looking replica. The two men were booked into jail. Only on Coin 6 tonight, a member of the Followers of Christ Faith Healing Church in Oregon City has pleaded guilty to criminally mistreating her son. Shannon Hickman already spent six years in prison for the death of her other son. In Clackamas County Court this afternoon, she admitted slapping her nine-year-old son on the side of the head, causing his nose to bleed in October of 2020. It was witnessed by a teacher who was doing a live video assessment of his homeschooling. Hickman said she was frustrated by his misbehaving. In a plea bargain, Shannon Hickman agreed to 30 days home confinement and two years probation, where she has to continue getting regular counseling for parenting skills. A cruise in Clark County say they had to put out a stubborn fire this morning that started in a homeless encampment between Highway 99 and I-5. They tell us flames spread from uh, tents and trees and other debris in that area. One person from that camp suffered minor injuries. Well, today, wildland fighters and fire boss pilots are doing water drops near Hag Lake. It is part of a training by the Oregon Department of Forestry. Now, that training started at the Hillsborough Airport, where boots on the ground firefighters and pilots met and discussed things that make air to ground communication better and easier. And Jenny Young spoke with one of the pilots. Why did you want to do this where they can come and like check out the plane and why, why is this part important? Well, it's huge because um, with, with the guys that were actually asking the questions that was in front of us, those are actually the guys out on the ground who were actually working. When you do it in a setting like this where it's, it's relaxed, there's no rush, it's really easy to actually train them up. So when we actually get out there on a real fire, that it's, it's just an easy transition. We know there are a lot of dangers with your job. Talk to us about some of those. In the terrain and the mountains and the power lines, those are the big, big things. The really gotchas that we really look out for, the terrain to us, not as big of a deal, is those hidden obstacles, the power lines that cut across a river or, you know, or go into a house place that you don't see. Towers, you know, those things can pop up, you know, overnight, you know, whether it be cell towers or whatever. These guys on the ground, how important is it, what they're doing, how important is that? Oh, it's huge. It's, uh, couldn't do it without them. We say it all the time, you know, you mentioned the danger of our job. You know, you can't overemphasize how uh, dangerous their job is because they're out there, you know, down in, you know, the terrain and the fire. But they're great. They're great to work with. Happening now, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation is back with their summer free-for-all events. There are dozens of free events happening now through the end of August to keep kids busy. Today, kids were able to get free lunch while doing arts and music activities in Northeast Portland. And for a full list of the summer free-for-all events, just go to portland.gov slash parks. That's portland.gov slash parks. Well, the St. Paul Rodeo returns this week. Starting Thursday, nearly 650 cowboys and cowgirls will start competing for prize buckles and cash winnings through the 4th of July. Now, the rodeo is the biggest event in the small town of St. Paul and one of the top 20 largest rodeos in the nation. Oregon's own Austin Foss won last year's bareback riding event at the St. Paul Rodeo, and he'll be back this year to defend his title. Tickets are available online at stpaulrodeo.com. You know, you're sitting next to the 1987 runner-up winner of the calf scramble at the Island County Fair. Nice are job. we really? Yeah, I won five dollars. Wow, <laughs> that's big. That's a big jackpot. Would you there. invest that five dollars in? I, it would have been worth a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you yeah. didn't. That was okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that's Long time ago. Yeah. All right. Well, weather-wise, uh, it, it looks like it's going to be not too bad for the folks who are going out there. Yeah, you never know. This summer there might get a little warm, might get a little cool. You, I mean, you guys have been there. Just we were recently, there last right? year. Yeah. Yeah, both of us. It's a yeah. fun event. That's yeah. true. Plenty of days to get out there. I mean, if you're thinking about heading out on maybe a Friday or through the weekend into the 4th of July, temperatures going to be in the 80s and 70s. 4th of July, there's actually on Monday, and we'll have to watch for maybe a chance for a shower there, and I will explain more about that here as we look at the future cast and we get into the extended forecast as we look at that weather story. Now, in the meantime, we're starting to push some of those clouds out of the way. Check out this view coming out of McMinnview. This is out of the Evergreen 
the Aviation and Space Museum. And by the way, if you haven't been there, you got to go. It's such a blast. But those clouds over the West Hills, they're going to stay there until late tonight when they start to move right back on in, kind of like a curtain. They're out and then they come right back on in as that onshore flow increases overnight tonight. We'll probably keep that marine layer in for the morning too. Very similar to what we had going on today. Near average temperatures over the next few days. It starts to get a little bit warmer towards the end of the week. And then as we get close to the 4th of July, definitely more cloud coverage, cooler. But I'm also tracking a chance for maybe a couple stray showers. Something that we'll definitely watch because that forecast can change over the next couple of days. But it's sure trending in that direction. Temperatures right now, 50s and 60s, depending on elevation. We have 69 out of Beaverton and some 70s out there. 73 coming out of PDX and 72 for Troutdale. So here around the greater Portland metro area, those temperatures in the 60s and lower 70s. Now we may still jump up about a degree or two, but this is likely going to be close to our high temperature for today, which is way different than yesterday where we topped off at 96 and a lot different than last year where we topped off at 116, which was the all time high. Hey, this list is starting to look a little fun, right? And starting to look a little more like summer. Now, this month, we've had plenty of temperatures across the 80s and 90s. Uh, the warmest temperature so far this year, 99 degrees. We haven't had to factor in July or August yet, so we'll see what happens there. But it doesn't really tell the whole story about this month because that list did make up those three days and those three days. But we've also had 10 days in the 70s, 12 days in the 60s. So we've definitely had some cool moments this month and also some rainy moments this month. OK, we do have that little weak disturbance to the north of us, bringing in some shower activity to the north areas around the Olympic Peninsula. They're seeing rain. They're seeing cloud coverage. We had our fair share of cloud coverage today as well, but we've been receding throughout the day and we're finally bringing in some broken clouds and some nice sunshine. Measurable rain. I uh, didn't see much here, but we did have a little splash out towards Astoria at 500 of an inch. Over the next couple of days, it's going to be nice and dry. But as I mentioned, Sunday into Monday, we may get a chance for a couple showers out there. For tomorrow, we'll keep clouds in the morning. Temperatures warming back into the 70s. Breezy coming out of the gorge, running out of the west. Could push about 20, 30 miles per hour. Future cast showing the clouds late tonight. They're out of here, but then they're back in. We'll hold it till about noon, probably tomorrow, before we start seeing a few sun breaks. Again, cloudier towards Mount Loma County and to the northwest. Fewer clouds to the south as we go through the day. Kind of the same song and dance as we go through the week. We'll have a few clouds in the morning, sunshine by afternoon until we get to about Friday where it may stick around a little bit longer. And then eventually heading into the weekend, we do have a couple stray showers in the forecast. That does include Sunday into Monday. Temperatures in the mid-70s tomorrow, about 80 degrees on Thursday and Friday. Really nice there. There's the weekend. You can see the 4th of July so far. I have it 72 degrees and maybe a passing shower. Hey, I'm up the whole week. Oh well. oh, well, dry oh, up to well. that point, but I don't think it's going to be much. I think folks get out there and really enjoy the day still. Gotcha. They will. That's yeah. I like your attitude, Joseph. <laughs> hey, coming up.